Doug Benefield, FSU law professor Dan Markell, and Jared Bridegan were all shot and killed. All three men were dads of young children, and all three men were in the midst of custody battles. Ashley Benefield shot and killed Doug after they agreed to attempt to reconcile. She claimed self-defense. All this happened after a contentious court battle where she accused Doug of trying to poison her, an accusation the judge did not believe. Dan Markell's estranged wife, Wendy Adelson, wanted to move her children 400 miles away from Tallahassee, where Dan worked, to South Florida, where her family was. In the middle of the case, Dan was murdered by two hitmen that prosecutors say were hired by Wendy's brother, Charlie Adelson. And Jared Bridegan and his ex, Shanna Gardner, were both remarried, sharing custody of their twins when a hitman took out Jared after a custody drop-off. And prosecutors say it was Shanna and her new husband who hired the hitman. Tonight, we examine all three murders to see if a motive really existed as we ask our experts, what if none of these dads were murdered? What would have happened in the custody cases? What would have happened to the children? I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us today here on Closing Arguments. And this is going to be, I think, an interesting hour because it's a problem that so many people have. Breakups of relationships, breakups of marriages, and, and battles over custody of the children. Who should be where, when? Who has the rights? Holidays, what schools should they go to? How should they be raised? All of this are, are things that many people, unfortunately because the relationship is broken up, have to deal with on, on a day-to-day -day basis. But let, let's back this up one second and start at a crime scene, right? And, and, and for investigators, many of the same questions are, are similar to what journalists will ask, which is why, right? Someone is killed. Investigators want to find out, well, why was this person killed? Because if you can figure out why, it may get you closer to the killer and helping you prove the case in looking for that evidence. And when you're telling a story as a journalist, you also want to know why. Why? Why, why, would, why was this man shot and killed in his driveway? It's, it's an important question, and it also becomes very relevant at a murder trial, too. Prosecutors like I was don't have to prove the why of it because that's motive evidence, but a jury's going to want to hear it. A jury's going to want that question answered just like the investigators and just like any journalist. So sometimes defendants like, I don't know, Ted Bundy, Charles Manson, there's no reasonable answer or explanation for why they did it. These are madmen. These are psychopaths. These are sociopaths. These are people where when you investigate why they did it, it doesn't really lead you anywhere because they're, they're, there's something wrong with them. They are wired differently. And some crimes are like that and some criminals are like that. But in the three cases we're looking at tonight, I think the allegations and, and the allegations of why will be front and center. But, but I, tonight I want to look at it, you know, was there really a motive? for these three to commit a murder that they've all been accused of? Was there a motive? And the reason I, I say that is people get divorced all the time. There are custody battles all the time. Usually these things can work themselves out. And in, and in this case, these three murders, it's all the fathers who are murdered. And Historically, it may not still be the same, but historically, mothers get a little bit of deference from most judges, I would think, inside a courtroom, if everything else is even, right? And if everyone else is, you know, pretty normal and not like off the tracks, I think, it's, I think there's a slight tilt that way. I may be wrong. We'll find out from our experts tonight. So was there a reason for two mothers and the brother of a mother to, to do this. 
And I want to answer this other question. To get to the answer of this, I think we have to look at the murders of Doug, Dan, and Jared, the three dads here, and say, well, what if? What if they weren't murdered? What if they were not the victims of murders? What would have happened in their cases? I mean, I don't think these cases are extraordinarily unusual, but we're going to focus in on some of the key issues and, and what was causing the problems in trying to resolve everything. But what would have happened? What if? What if they had lived? Would the moms have gotten what they were seeking in, in these custody battles? So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to bring in a panel of experts. But first, let's, let's give you a little bit of background in, in these stories. And we'll begin with uh, Ashley Benefield. And this is a story um, involving a, a woman who herself shoots and kills her husband but is claiming self-defense. Take a listen. Everything was very normal. I had two loving parents. That is 21-year-old Eva Benefield, reminiscing on what life was like with her parents, Doug and Renee. Eva lost her mother back in December of 2015 from an undiagnosed heart condition. From then on, her family life became unsettled. Nine months after her mother's death, Eva's father, Doug, met 24-year-old Ashley Byers, a ballerina and swimsuit model, and two weeks later, they were married. He eventually fessed up and he said, yeah, so we're dating. Uh, the next day I met her and we picked her up from the hotel that she was staying at here in Charleston. And then the following day, it was a Sunday, he told me that they were actually married, not just dating. Their marriage quickly began to deteriorate once Ashley became pregnant. Shortly after that is when she starts all the drama of accusations, but that started the real problems between Ashley and Doug. As Ashley and Doug's relationship became more and more strained, the two became embroiled in a bitter custody battle over their young daughter. They went to court to hash it all out, but Ashley went on to make a shocking accusation, claiming that Doug poisoned her while she was pregnant. It was a dramatic accusation that involved days of testimony in court in Manatee County. We had nationally recognized experts that testified, and there was just no evidence at all. It was an accusation the judge didn't believe, saying Ashley's story didn't possess a scintilla of truth. Despite the bitter conflict, Doug had been trying to work things out with Ashley, but the tensions between them grew. And on September 27th, 2020, it all came to a head. She's with me now, quite upset. The weapon is here. We need the police before the mother, the, her mother and the little girl gets back from the park. I don't want them to find it. Yeah. You want me to go over and look at anything or just wait you, for the police? No, I want you to just wait for the police, okay? So you, they were in an argument? I don't know. She came in. She was quite hysterical. I didn't know who was banging on my door. She said that she attacked her and she shot him. They've been having trouble. Ashley shot Doug with a 45 caliber handgun, an act that took the life of Eva's only surviving parent. I, I mean, at first, you know, it was really devastating, but I have a great support system. I have a lot of good friends and um, family. Ashley claims she acted in self-defense, but prosecutors aren't buying it and have charged her with second-degree murder. So they're down in Florida, and they're, they're having this battle in court over custody. She's trying to get a restraining order against Doug, wanting to keep him away, et cetera. Um, so there was a point where Doug Benefield is questioned by Ashley Benefield's attorney. We have the audio from that hearing in 2018 where we learn a lot more about what was going on between these two. Let's take a listen. You agree your wife asked for injunctive relief in South Carolina? She asked for you. She said she was afraid of you in South Carolina and asked for a restraining order. Yes, sir, that's correct. And you agree that um, since she moved to Florida, you've started attending her church in Florida? We had begun attending it together, and... Um, Sir, listen to my question. Okay. Since she relocated to Florida, have you attended her church in Florida? Yes, sir, when I'm attending, I do attend it. You indicate the date that the two of you separated was September 18th, correct? Um, 
Mm, September 18th of two, 2017 yeah. is when you August, separated? August 25th was when I drove her to Florida, and then September 18th was the date that she came back and got some of her stuff out of the house. And she left you a note that said, I'm not coming back, right? No, sir, it didn't. I don't recall it saying I'm not coming back. That's, in fact, we continued to communicate by text after that. It was after September 18th that you then reached out to the pastor, the pastor of her church, and uh, got involved with them. You asked for the pastor to communicate with Ashley first, correct? Yes, yes, I did not understand what was going on, so I reached out to the pastor to do what pastors do and to mediate. You weren't able to reconcile through the pastor, correct? Uh, she would not speak to the pastor. She spoke to the pastor one time and then never called her back. Okay. So she's made no effort to reconcile with you after September 18th, correct? Uh, that's not correct. Our text messages were different and text messages included at one point she said, if you want to gain my trust. So we did text back and forth about the ballet. Um, I was still busy raising money for the ballet, including for the dance work company that I even after she left, I'd set her up as a senior vice president and um, for, so she could have a career even after the ballet. Um, I raised $350,000 total, which we have the records for. And so does that have anything still, to do with my question about reconciliation? Uh, yes, it does, because we were communicating after the fact. So, okay. And she did lead me to believe uh, specifically one time about gaining her trust, which is what I took as a motion towards reconciliation. So she look around. They were in South Carolina. Then she moves down to Florida. That's where her mom is, and he apparently follows her down there. Now his attorney spoke with us. We've invited both sides on, but only one side is speaking with us. But Stephanie Murphy, Doug Benefield's attorney, spoke to us about what was happening just prior to her shooting Doug. Take a listen. It was an odd situation, actually. So. In the court case, we had a hearing coming up a couple days after the murder where uh, psychological evaluations that had been put into place by the sheriff's department were going to be released. And there was a joint motion to release those. Just a couple of days prior, the parties had gone to a mediation where they advised the mediator and with their attorneys saying that they were reconciling and moving to Maryland together as a family and it was their intention to dismiss the cases as soon as those psychological evaluations were released. So mediation was Thursday. The hearing to release the psyche valves was Wednesday of the following week. She killed him Sunday night before he was able to get his hands on those reports. It's a very unusual situation, right? So you've got these psyche evaluations that are being going to be released. The couple had agreed uh, that they were going to reconcile and move together but it didn't seem like that was necessarily her intention. Let me bring in my guest. We'll get to the bottom of this. I have great experts tonight. Joining us tonight from River Edge, New Jersey. She's a family law attorney, and together we were baby lawyers in Bergen County, New Jersey. Janelle Weinstein is with us. In Atlanta, Georgia, family law attorney, law professor Randy Kessler. And in Stony Brook, New York, the family law attorney currently representing the innocent children of the accused Long Island killer, Aves Metev, is with us. Uh, great to see everyone tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Janelle, it's a complicated situation, and my guess is that the work that the three of you do is never simple. So um, let's get to what, how this thing may have resolved itself or what could have happened if Doug is not shot and killed by Ashley. Psych evaluations coming out, what does that mean? And what does it mean when you tell a mediator that you're going to reconcile? Yeah, from, it sounds like there is a roller coaster ride going on with this couple. They're together, they're not together. She moves to her mom's. And it sounds like at mediation, they made some progress. Um, what happens here when you have couples that don't really know what they want to do, they haven't really made the decision, it sounds like they were reconciling. It sounds like both parties were saying that. They could have got together, became a family again. On the other hand, it seems that somebody could have been concerned about those evaluations. What, what 
strikes me odd here though is they both do the evaluations were going to be coming in a few days they went to mediation they said they were going to reconcile so it would be interesting to know what happened after those evaluations but at the end of the day everybody loses obviously and most importantly the children or the child in this case because they don't have either of their parents all right randy let, let me ask let me throw another little twist in here we believe some of the evidence may be when it comes to those evaluations and what she was telling um, her, her psychologist or psychiatrist was that she never wanted to reconcile with him. But she was saying one thing to the mediator, but saying something else privately to her psychologist or psychiatrist. What impact does that all have on the case? If you're, is, is the mediator an arm of, of the court itself or is it completely separate? Can you, can you say one thing there and say something else and have different intentions? How, how does a court deal with that? Oh, come on, one question at a time, Vinny, you know? Well, you're so, the professor. All right, all right, so a mediator is, is sort of the arm of the court, but it's a confidential situation. Unless there's a crime that's going to be committed, then they have to reveal that. You know, but with these, yes, I love him, I want to be back with him, no, I don't want to, there are a lot of reasons. There's a famous book that's called you know, I hate you, don't leave me, right? These, these people are back and forth and we see it all the time. I'm sure the other folks, I'm sure Vess and, and Janelle see this. We, we never know what they really mean, but sometimes you say whatever it takes to get out of the room or to advance the process. Or you say behind closed doors to somebody, yeah, maybe we can reconcile. And then they come to us and they say, I don't want to reconcile, I want out, but I didn't want to tell them because I was afraid of them. So it's hard to figure out what people truly mean. Um, and, that, and that's really the job of the court. Every judge will tell you, they would rather try a murder case than a custody dispute. Yeah, I know that. All right, Vess, let, let, what rights do people have? So she moves, she's trying to get a restraining order in South Carolina, then moves to Florida, and he follows down to Florida. Is that a problem? Well, it, it would seem to be, and you can hear the questioning in the clip that we played earlier, that the, you know the lawyer is trying to get at the fact as to why did you why did you follow her, why did you join her church, right? And he kind of keeps dodging the whole answer. He says, "Well, this is actually evidence we attended it together." You know, she had no interest reconciling. Well, I don't think so. She sent me texts. You know, so this is back and forth, which you ordinarily don't get in a murder trial, right? You don't get to cross-examine the, the the complaining witness until they're on the stand in front of the jury. So. Uh, obviously, you know, love runs afoul here, but at the same time, uh, you have these people trying to piece together the case in retrospect. And, and we all know the one thing judges hate the most after being appealed is getting their face on the newspaper the next day after they've made a custody decision that's gone completely awry because hindsight is twenty twenty. So that's the problem that we have here, right? Everyone's trying to piece back together something that in the moment looked perfectly ordinary. And, and parties are always free to chart their litigation course. They can participate in mediation. They can pull back the case at any time. The judges are powerless over that. They can't stop that. As my colleague said, though, the one person that always seems to suffer inherently are the children. So is there any way, Vess, that she potentially could have, If and I think this is going to be her story, right? She's claiming self-defense. I think she's going to claim in this trial that she was scared of this man. Um, what would she have to do, what would she have to prove in order to keep the child and herself away from Doug Benefield? Well, the interesting part about this is obviously in the murder case, she's going to have to take the stand. Anytime you have a self-defense or, or an abused, battered spouse defense, she's going to have to take the stand. The jurors are going to have to hear from her. Otherwise, it's not going to be a convincing story. Whereas in any other murder case, you would tell your client, you know, as a former prosecutor, and the defense attorney would, would do anything except put their client on the stand. So her only choice in this case is to convince the jury that what she did was the right call back then. All right, we've got a lot more to get to tonight. We've got three big stories. Um, when we come back, we're going to talk about um, Jared Bridegan. Um, or, no, no, not Jared Bridegan, Charlie Adelson. It's very confusing, all these cases. Charlie Adelson, um, down in Florida, is accused of murdering his former brother-in-law. We'll get to that, plus coming up next hour. In the low country of South Carolina, Buster Murdoch, the only family member not murdered by Alec Murdoch, speaks out for the first time since his father's guilty verdict. Is he saying something different than what he said on the witness stand? When you got there, um, did you see your dad? Yes, sir. What kind of 
condition was he in? What was his demeanor? Yeah, his demeanor was, I mean, he was destroyed. He was heartbroken. I walked in the door and saw him and um, gave him a hug and just, just broke it down. A victim with celebrity ties from Stormy Daniels to once being engaged to Drew Carey. Now her alleged killer faces a jury. The Hollywood Obsession Murder Trial. Trial coverage weekdays at 8, 7 central on Court TV. These are the cases that captivated the world. Can keep my life straight. They were killed by their own children. Jeffrey! Court TV Legendary Trials. Go to courttv.com slash legendary trials to find out how to watch. Uh, when did you separate from Mr. Markell? We separated in the fall of 2012. Are you familiar with a court order ordering you to come back to Tallahassee from South Florida? I'm not familiar with that. Was there a time during the time that you were living there at Aqua Ridge, Aqua Ridge that you determined that you would like to move to South Florida with the children? There was. All right. And were your parents very involved in trying to facilitate that relocation? My parents were supportive of me moving to South Florida. Would you describe your parents as being over-involved in your personal business? As compared to other people's parents? Yeah. I don't know. Did he ever joke about he looked into hiring a hitman, but buying you a TV as a divorce present would be cheaper? He did make that joke. He tended to repeat himself, and sometimes he would make jokes that weren't very funny about all kinds of things. All right, and was that TV, did he buy you a TV as a divorce person? He did. So her brother Charlie makes a joke about hiring a hitman to kill her ex-husband, and then her ex-husband is killed by a hitman. Let me take a look at the family tree here so you understand all the relationships here because this is what prosecutors are alleging. Take a look. Uh, you've got Wendy Adelson. She was just on the witness stand. She's all the way to the left, all right? Next to her is her mom. Uh, below her is her, uh, is her ex-husband, Dan Markell. They were going through this custody battle. They had children together. Well, Donna has another child named Charlie, and then Harvey is Charlie's dad and Donna's husband and Wendy's dad. So those are the Adelsons, really rich people from South Florida. They're dentists. Charlie was dating a shot girl named Catherine McBanoa. Uh, the shot girl, Catherine McBanoa, um, the father of her children was Sigfredo Tuto, Tuto Garcia, who was friends with Luis Tato Rivera, who was a Latin king. So the allegation is, is that Charlie, through Catherine, got Sigfredo to get together with Luis and drive 400 miles from South Florida up to Tallahassee to kill Dan Markell. Here's Luis Rivera, the hitman, on the witness stand explaining um, his understanding of why him and his friend Sigfredo were going to Tallahassee. I thought we were going to go rob him. You thought you were coming to Tallahassee to do a robbery? Yes, ma'am. Did you assume that, or did somebody tell you that? No, I assumed that. I'm like, you know, it was just a job. All right. So you knew it was a job in Tallahassee, and you assumed it was a robbery. Did you learn something additional about what it was on the way to Tallahassee? Yeah, and the way coming up, like halfway there, we just... He said we're going to have to um, kill the man. You said you were going to have to kill the man? Yeah. And what was the second part of what you said? For some kids. For some kids. All right, anything else? What did that mean to you, kill the man for some kids? As for a lady. Um, I guess the lady wanted her kids back. And that lady, allegedly, according to prosecutors, would be Wendy Adelson in this custody battle. Now, things were nasty, but what was the actual status of it? Because tonight we're looking at, well, what if? What if Dan Markell was not murdered. What would have happened in that custody battle? Was there an actual motive for the murder? So here's Ruth Markell, Dan's mom. I spoke with her and she gave us sort of an insight into the status of this custody battle. It was a, there were several issues. Remember this was the divorce had finished. There was already a petition uh, that the Adelsons had initiated with the court. Uh, to try to get um, the family to be able to move uh, to to South Florida. 
with or without them, meaning, you know, they, they wanted just to get there. And that petition was, was thrown out. So um, it wasn't yet, you know, very much resolved in any way, you know, was in the heart of the conflict. And it was in a very, very intense, very, very contentious, intense conflict. The custody, I mean, their children were 50-50 with Ben and 50-50 with Wendy. Uh, but the, you know, the facts of where they would live and how they would live uh, and then, you know, sort of what type of family life, uh, those were sort of the open-ended questions at the time. All right, let's bring back in our experts, Janelle Weinstein, uh, Ves Metev, and Randy Kessler. Randy, I'll start with you. Um, this has to be a pretty common problem, right? Someone, they have, they're living together as a family in Tallahassee, but somebody wants to move. She wants to stay in state, but it's 400 miles away. 400 miles. So what, what happens? What do courts do? Is there any way she could win that and get her children down to South Florida if Dan did not agree to do it because he's a law professor at FSU? Well, being a law professor is not necessarily the issue. It's a question of what kind of parent is he? What's best for the children? So in cases like this, we get a guardian. We get somebody who's a court-appointed expert to do an investigation, and we try to do it quickly and expedite it, and they will recommend it to the court because when I show up in court, Everyone looks nice, we're in our church clothes, we're in suits and ties. The judge needs to know what's going on behind the scenes. If you can't get an expert, you gotta bring in your witnesses and you gotta make your case and you gotta do it quickly. And sometimes the squeaky wheel gets the oil. We gotta be the squeaky wheel, we gotta get in front of the judge and explain why it's in the best interest of the children to be with mom and to move or do whatever mom is suggesting. That's, it's, it's a hard uphill battle, but uh, it, it's a lot better than, than murder. Well, Vess, uh, Metev, let me ask you, if. If both parents are good parents, you know, and there's, there's no problems, it's just she wants to be where her family is down in South Florida raising her children. She doesn't want to be in Tallahassee. It's much different lifestyle, et cetera. Um, what, what if everything's even? Like, it could, would a judge potentially order that, yes, Dan Markell, if you want to see your kids regularly, you need to move to South Florida? Yeah, it happens all the time. I mean, courts look at other factors, you know, who's the parent that's better suited to give the child's uh, intellectual upbringing, their emotional stability, what kind of support system do they have, what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of uh, arts and, and, and theater and, and accessibility to knowledge and education in school. So that happens all the time. And what judges do is they give the parent that gets the right to relocate, they balance that by giving the other parent additional time, like three weeks during the summer, a month during the summer, every holiday, that kind of thing. So it's not just both parents are good parents. It's where is the environment going to be the most suitable to raise this child in? Whether that's a secondary support system, whether that's better schools, whether that's you know a higher you know New York is supposedly the capital of entertainment, theater, all these all these highfalutin concepts that we have that may matter not at all to a child growing up on the island or anywhere else, but they're still brought in all the time. All right, Janelle. There was another issue that was causing some friction as well. Um, Professor Dan Markell was raising them much more strictly. They were, they, both parties are Jewish, but I think he was leaning much more towards being orthodox, whereas the Adelsons were a little bit not as strict in, in the way that they were um, trying, wanted the children to be raised. Who makes that call? And is that, is that a battle that could be won um, by either party? Well, those calls are very difficult for the courts because it comes down to religious beliefs and how they're going to raise the children. And there's got to be some consistency for the child so that they understand what their belief system is and how that is going to evolve. The problem with that and the problem with the relocation is the parents had these children and the idea is that both parents should be involved. They had a 50-50 parenting time plan. And it's important to look at that benefits for the children. And now to change that, if that's going to be not in their best interest, then the parents have to understand, particularly the parent who's looking to move, to look at the fact that it may not be in their best interest to have less time with dad and more time with mom in a different environment. When we talk about religious upbringing, what tends to happen as a practical matter is when they're with dad who's more religious, they're doing more strict orthodox practices and when they're in mom they're doing less strict let, let me throw a, let me throw a twist a twist in all of this because there are allegations here that the this thing got so bitter 
that the Adelsons were threatening to send the children to Christian school, despite the fact that everyone's Jewish. Send the kids to Christian school and were clearly giving them cheeseburgers and, and meals that were not kosher. If things start getting petty and spiteful like that, um, does, a, does a court hold that against uh, the side that's doing that? Yes, I believe that they do in the fact that they're intentionally trying to do something different, which is not in the best interest of the child. And remember, that's what it comes down to. Courts aren't really that interested about mom or dad. They're only interested in what's best for these children. These parents are supposed to be taking care of these children. They're supposed to be doing the right things. And so that kind of what I call nonsense doesn't bode well with the judge. All right, and as I was describing that scenario, Randy sort of smiled, and I think you've come across a situation like that through your years of, of, of these cases, so understood. All right, everyone stay where you are. When we come back, um, we've got one more case, a custody battle. This one's a little different, though, because this couple had been divorced for like seven years, yet the battles were continuing, and in the end, uh, Jared Brightigan was taken out by a hitman. I started hearing these stories about murder and stuff. I'm about to be the biggest drug dealer that you can become. <laughs> oh my God, are they starting a war with me or what? I'm not gonna lie, it felt good to be a gangster. She just points the gun out of my face. Boom, 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 boom. Just shoots me. We knew that what we were doing had consequences. But we just didn't care. Vice on Court TV. Weeknights at 7, 6 central. Only on Court TV. It's going to be the white vehicle back there. There was the arrest of Shanna Gardner, arrested at her home the alleged mastermind of a murder plot to kill her ex-husband. I'll go to that. These two have been split up for like seven years, yet there was still this custody battle going on. Matt Johnson has more for us tonight. Jared Bright again appeared to have it all. A new job as a Microsoft executive, living in sunny Florida with his wife Kirsten and four children. We had just had London, she was six months old. So things were good. Kirsten had two children with Jared, London and Bexley. They also shared custody of his nine-year-old twins from a previous marriage. On the week that we did not have the oldest two kids at our home, Jared would take them out to dinner. It was referred to as date night in this agreement. The agreement kept Jared and Kirsten in Florida. Bride again and his ex-wife, Shanna Gardner-Fernandez, were in a bitter custody battle. What was that relationship like, he and his ex-wife? The relationship between us and his ex-wife um, was not cordial. Our communications were always in writing because there was not mutual trust between the two households. On February 16th, 2022, Jared had one of his scheduled daddy date nights. After dinner, he dropped off his twin daughter and son at his ex-wife's home in Jacksonville Beach, Florida and headed home to St. Augustine. On the way, he stopped to get his two and a half year old daughter Bexley ice cream. She was in the back seat of his SUV. He then called Kirsten telling her he loved her and would be home soon. How did you learn something was wrong? As time started ticking by and the time that they're usually home passed, I, I can't even describe it, but like, I just knew something's not right. Her fears became reality after an officer answered Jared's cell phone, telling her Bexley was unharmed. But they needed her to come by the police station to hear about her husband. They later on that night told me that he had been shot. Where did this happen? Because he usually gets in the car and just drives home. I had talked to him. Jared was not a victim of any robbery gone wrong or carjacking. Police say he was the victim of a targeted attack on a one-way road. He traveled often. Jared came across a tire police say was intentionally placed right here in the middle of the road in the sanctuary neighborhood of Jacksonville Beach, Florida. That's when someone came out of these woods and ambushed the father of four, killing him on the spot. For almost a year, no answers. Then in January 2023, a break in the case. Henry Tenen 
was arrested for the following crimes. Conspiracy to commit murder, second degree murder with a weapon, accessory after the fact to a capital felony and child abuse. Now investigators say that Tennant has pleaded guilty in the case and admitted to shooting Brightigan. Henry Tennant pled guilty to murdering Jared Brightigan. Henry Tennant has admitted that he in fact was the shooter. According to court records, Tennant once lived in this house that was once owned by Brightigan's ex-wife's current husband. And now investigators have charged both the ex-wife, Shanna Gardner, and her husband, Mario Fernandez Saldana with first-degree murder. We will be filing a notice of our intent to seek the death penalty. Prosecutors call Gardner the mastermind behind the murder. Both Shanna and Mario have denied any involvement. Meanwhile, Jared's widow says that she suspected them from the beginning. Had you suspected that Mario was also involved in all of this? From very, very early on, um, I felt, like obviously I didn't have any evidence, but I felt that Mario Fernandez and Shanna Gardner would be involved it's somehow. So what exactly was going on? These two are split for seven years and the twins are growing up. Uh, take a listen uh, again to uh, Kirsten Brightigan, Jared's widow. Everything is a fight. So when Jared was alive, Shanna would take us to family court over and over and over for what we thought were frivolous lawsuits. She didn't win most of them um, because the judge saw through what she was doing. Um, and that was the entire relationship. We never spoke on the phone or in person. It was all via text or email. So everything was in writing. Like there was just zero trust from us for them. Let's bring back in our experts, Janelle Weinstein, Vess Metev, and Randy Kessler. Vess, seven years later, it's still going on. It, it never ends. Um, if he didn't get murdered, would, would anything change? I mean, how drastically can things change seven years into this as the twins are growing? Well, th this is the perfect scenario where any you know, anytime you have a conspiracy charge, there's always the conspirator plus one. So you plus one, and there's always the trigger man. So what happens in these cases, 99% of the time is the trigger man rolls over in the conspirator and they usually get the lesser penalty or take a plea deal. So what happens is obviously in this case, the embers keep on smoldering, small petty things become, you know, trivial annoyances, which then in turn grow into these just visceral hatreds, they're stalactites, and these people really have nothing else to do. And at some point, some someone resorts to this. And I think it's a great fallacy, by the way, that people that work in white collar jobs are immune to this. And the answer is they're not. There's dentists, lawyers, doctors, uh, you know, people that we associate with having high uh, intellects and, and, and high level of of employments that still get caught up in this on both sides. And again, who suffers? The children. Absolutely. So Randy, are you, you shocked that they're still having problems this far down the road? And would there be any way for this to resolve itself? Or is it a continuing kind of grind um, that flares up? You know, sometimes when spouses remarry and move on or get into new relationships, it's a good thing. If you get involved with somebody who's mature, a good step parent, Wonderful. It sounds like that wasn't the case here. It sounds like the new husband had some issues with the former husband or the fact that his wife had a child or two with the former husband and therefore his ego was threatened or whatever it is. And, you know, you want to stand up for your woman. You want to, and it, it got out of hand. It went to the, you know, level of ridiculousness and absurdity and criminality if that's, uh, if the allegations are true. We see it often. You know, choose a mate carefully. It can be somebody that can help you move forward or can be someone who stokes the flames and keeps you embroiled in the divorce. And we see divorces that last at least 18 years until children you know, reach the age of majority and sometimes beyond. And uh, it sounds like that's what this was. Janelle Weinstein, it was very interesting that all communication was written. There was all this mistrust um, in a situation like that. Did, do you ever see it if, again, if uh, Jared is not murdered of this thing kind of getting smoothed over, or was this just going to be the way it would be until the children reached 18 and made up their own minds about everything? Yeah, unfortunately, Vinny, in my experience, it usually stays the same. It's very hard to change those behaviors unless everybody wants to do that. It's not unusual to communicate only through applications. We have our family wizard or in writing, text. 
uh, and not having any communication. And it's very, very sad for the children. They know, they pick up on the fact their parents aren't communicating with each other. They go to the school plays and there are different sides of the room. And I find that as the children get older, it sometimes even gets worse as time goes on. But they turn 18 and then it becomes a different game altogether because they have their lives excluded from the other parent. But when they're so intertwined in these parenting time plans and co-parenting at this young age, it just gets worse before it gets better. And Randy, what happens in all these scenarios now, you've got uh, family members that have been arrested, right? So whether it's the mother who's arrested in two of our cases, one, it's the uncle who's arrested. Um, do the children stay in contact with that parent, even though they've been accused of being involved in the murder of the other parent? Would Uncle Charlie have any opportunity? Would, would he be able to see his, his, his nieces and nephews? That's the delicate balance, right? We're, you're innocent until proven guilty. That's one tenet of our law. And the other one that's just as big and iconic standard is best interest of the children. It's best for children to know their parents. If they have a living parent, we're gonna do everything we can to keep that relationship in a safe, secure environment. It might be supervised, it might be monitored, it might be FaceTime only, but there's gonna be some sort of compromise until it's clear that somebody being around a child is a harm to that child. You want natural parents and natural relatives to be around the children. Children need that. That's what we think of as a society. That's what we start off with. Children should be around their parents and their relatives unless something bad is gonna happen. And we can do a lot of things in family court. We can supervise, we can put in safeguards. Um, judges have a hard job, like I said before, they hate custody disputes because they're really terrible. And the, the results, if they get it wrong, could be devastating. That's why I don't step foot. I don't step foot in those family courtrooms. I stay out. Janelle Weinstein, Vest Metev, uh, Metev, and Randy Kessler, uh, thank you all so much. Uh, great insight. We appreciate your time, and I hope to see all of you very, very soon.